Good morning. Thank you all for joining this special student event with our Cronkite Award winner, Dean Baquet, Executive Editor of the New York Times. I'm Kristen Gilbert, Interim Dean of the Cronkite School, and I'm here to start off the conversation introducing the two people who will lead it today. But first, I want to give you a bit of history. Uh, for 37 years, the Cronkite School has recognized one of the nation's great journalists with the Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. And typically, we give this award at a luncheon for, with about 1,000 people in attendance. Um, uh, this year's event, we couldn't do that way. We did it virtually yesterday with hundreds of people there. It was a wonderful event. And if you missed it and didn't get to hear Mr. Baquet's speech, uh, we will have it posted, I think, as soon as later today, and I really encourage you to take the time to listen. I think you'll find uh, what Mr. Baquet said to be both refreshingly honest and, and hopeful of, about the person of journalism. So each year, in addition to the big awards ceremony, we invite honoree to speak to our students in a session like this. And don't tell anyone this, but I often think it's the best part. Uh, we'll have an hour for this conversation, and we do invite your questions. We'll begin the audience Q&A around 1055, uh, but start thinking of what you'd like to ask now. Um, you can submit your questions through the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to introduce our facilitators, starting with uh, Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Uh, Mackenzie is a junior majoring in journalism and minoring in business. She came to the Cronkite School from Anchorage, Alaska, and she's built a really impressive record here in a short time uh, as a health reporter for Cronkite News, a student worker in our equipment lab, a teaching assistant for video production classes, and she also helps production events for Arizona PBS. Um, she has interned for the city of Phoenix, was a reporting fellow last summer for a special project on how COVID has affected underserved communities. And um, she also serves on the executive board for the Native American Journalists Association at ASU. And this summer, she's going to be interning at CNBC. Mackenzie will be assisted by one of our great faculty members, Vanessa Ruiz, who's Director for Diversity Initiatives and Community Engagement at Cronkite. And in this role, Vanessa leads our efforts to ensure that the school is a diverse and welcoming place for all. Vanessa is also the lead instructor for our required ethics and diversity class, uh, classes. Um, to Cronkite. Vanessa had a successful career as a television reporter and anchor. Most recently, she was the main evening news anchor for KPNX, uh, the NBC affiliate in, in Phoenix. So with that, I want to turn it over to Vanessa and Mackenzie, who will introduce uh, Mr. Baquet. Mackenzie. Awesome. Thank you um, so much for your introduction, Dean Gilger, um, and thank you to all who could join today for this awesome ins and insightful student event. I'm super grateful to have this opportunity to speak with Dean today um, and learn from his expertise. So um, just to get things started, I wanted to first formally introduce Dean to those who may be a little unfamiliar um, with who he is. Dean Baquet is the executive editor of the New York Times, one of the nation's leading and most respected news outlets. As executive editor, he leads the Times' newsroom and oversees the New York Times' news report in all its various forms. He is also the first black editor, executive editor of the Times in its 170 year history. Mr. Baquet joined the newspaper in 1990 as an investigative reporter. Over the next decade, he went on to be special projects editor for the business desk, deputy metro editor and national editor. In 2000, he left the paper to join the Los Angeles Times where he served as managing editor and then editor of the paper. He returned in 2007 to lead the Times' Washington Bureau and was named managing editor in 2011. He assumed the executive editor position in 2014. During his tenure as managing editor and top editor, the newspaper has won 16 gold surprises. Mr. Baquet started his journalism career as a reporter at the Times Picayune newspaper in New Orleans, where he worked for nearly seven years before joining the Chicago Tribune. While at the Chicago Tribune, he served as associate metro editor for investigations and was chief investigative reporter covering corruption in politics and the garbage hauling industry. 
He was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting in March 1988, where he led a team of three in documenting corruption in the Chicago City Council and was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in 1994 in the investigative reporting category. Mr. Baquet has also received numerous local and regional awards, including the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press Award in 2018 and the Larry Foster Award for Integrity in Public Communication in 2019. Okay, so all right, Dean, we, <laughs> I know. Thank you for that. <laughs> of course. So we do have a few questions for you today before we move on to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, and to start it off, simple, um, what is your definition of good journalism? Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> good journalism is based on facts. Um, it's, it's honest. Um, meaning that to me, to my mind, that encompasses opinion, which I do not run, and news, because even opinion, the best opinion, is ba makes its case with facts. And <clears throat> good journalism has wants to have impact. It's not it's not just cerebral and intellectual. It wants to have impact on the world. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's re uh, that's really insightful. Um, and then just the next question. So after decades in journalism, um, is there any philosophy, motto, value, or mentality um, that you've been able to maintain that has kept you going, um, even in the toughest times of um, your career and your reporting? Yeah, I think most, most professions don't fully have a mission. Or, or if they have a mission, it's not, it's not as grand as the mission of journalism. <clears throat> I mean, of course, everybody has a mission, but, but I think journalism has the grandest mission. Um, it really does. It's, it's, it's to do the public good and to serve the public. <clears throat> and whenever I find myself, you know, struggling under criticism or you know, struggling with internal internal turmoil. I mean, I run a, a newsroom with 1,700 people in it, right? So not every minute of it is fun. <clears throat> um, but I remind myself that it's all in service of a, of a large and important mission. And that, that, that may seem, you know, treacly or um, syrupy, but, it, but it's actually true, right? I mean, if you if you just sort of keep focus on this on the fact that you have a mission and you have a goal and you're supposed to serve the public it just helps helps you see through a lot of the stuff that that gets in the way you know dean i, I wouldn't necessarily say it's therapy at all one of the things we share with our students is that journalism is one of those critical pieces that we need in mm -hmm. order to make sure that our democracy stays alive and stays thriving so Again, not syrupy at all. Good. Thank you. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have seen, I, I think the word really is reckoning in regard to the concept of what objectivity and journalism is. And I know you did touch upon that yesterday yeah. during the remarks. How would you define objectivity now? And also, what do you think of this generational shift yeah. that we have seen regarding the concept of, object, of objectivity? You know, I think that objectivity has been misunderstood, including by newsrooms, including, you know, in my own newsroom, including by me. <clears throat> I mean, it's worth, it, it's worth, I mean, the history of objectivity, objectivity was designed to, to give a quick history in a, in an era when news organizations were coming from all sort of political beliefs and, and facts weren't even accepted, right? People made stuff up. <clears throat> so the notion of objectivity was that it was supposed to be almost scientific that facts and the things collected for a story went through some, something that mirrored the scientific method. Over, and, and the idea was to be fair and to present your audience with, with multiple sides. Over time, we all, including me, frankly, got a little bit lazy <clears throat> and we started to use it, you know, like, I mean, any reporter who does not, who disagrees with what I'm about to say is not telling you the truth where you've been on deadline writing a story and you suddenly realize you need a quote from the other party and you go, oh my God, and you pick up the phone and you just get a quote. Well, that's not really wrestling with facts. That's just adorning your story with quotes. And, and, we, and we've done that um, and that's a mistake. So 
I'm, I try not to use the word objectivity because it's become a lightning rod. So here's my view. Most stories do have multiple perspectives and multiple sides, they just do. Not all, um, I mean, what happened on January 6th at the Capitol does not have multiple sides, it was a riot. But most story, and we called it a riot, but most stories, religion, um, how to deal with policing, how to deal with crime in America, how to deal with income inequality, those stories all have multiple, they're complicated. And the role of a journalist is to pour through and test all of those ideas and to sort of draw something close to either draw a conclusion if that's possible or present them in a thoughtful way, shedding all of the bull and all of the other stuff. So to me, it's to, it's to sort of test notions and to, to, to come as close, close as possible to telling the truth. And objectivity was never supposed to be a person. Nobody's objective, I'm not objective. It was a method, it was a system. And I still believe that this, the goal of that method and system should be to come up with the truth, to tell the truth. I'm curious to follow up on that, Dean. Have you had conversations perhaps with maybe some of your younger reporters uh, regarding this topic? Mm -hmm. uh, have they changed your mind or maybe had an opportunity to make you see things uh, a little bit differently? Yeah, first off, I, you know, I, I quoted Bill Kovic um, in, in my speech yesterday, who, who said one of my favorite things, which is that every generation <clears throat> wants to sort of create its own journalism. Yeah, I think, that, I think that the next generation of journalists are challenging us, and they should. I challenged, you know, I, I was once a young reporter <laughs> a very long time ago. And I challenge some of the notions of, of the people who, who I worked for. And they should challenge us. Um, and we should listen to them. Because not only, everybody thinks of this as just a, just a purely a generational shift. It's more than that. I mean, a lot of the things we adhere to came from the print era. And then the print era is dying. And the challenges of, of journalism today are not only the, that you want to build a diverse staff that challenges you, <clears throat> it's also that you want, you, we have to tell stories very differently. I mean, I run a newsroom now that has a giant video operation and a podcasting operation. So I, I want to hear those challenges and we've changed as a result of them. We change, we've, we've changed the way we do things. I mean, if you're not going to listen, you really shouldn't be in the business of journalism, to my mind. Mackenzie? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it sounds like what you're um, talking about has a lot to do with um, being open to evolution of, of objectivity in general. And I, yeah. I really appreciate that because I am a part of this generational shift. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was... Can I, can I tell you one, one story from history, if you don't mind me interrupting? Yeah, so, of course. And, I re, and I think a lot about the history of journalism. I mean, if you go back to the Vietnam War, news organizations in the beginning covered the Vietnam War pretty much taking everything that the government told them, which was the way news organizations covered war historically, the traditional news organizations. You always had people who were, who were not in traditional newsrooms. And then a generation of war correspondents started challenging what the government was saying in Vietnam. And that was important. And it was important for the people who ran newsrooms to listen to that. And that was a, that was a sort of a revolution, right? Um, and it changed the way, it should change the way we cover government and think about the truthfulness of government. So that was a previous generation that challenged the way, I mean, that was in the 1960s and they challenged the way newsrooms operated and they were right. Okay, um, moving on to just the next question. Um, journalism has a race problem. And by that, I mean, um, not just in the lack of 
accurate coverage of diverse communities, but also within the newsrooms. According to a 2018 Pew Research Center analysis, newsrooms, newsroom employees are less diverse than U.S. workers overall, with over three quarters of employees being white. As the first Black ex executive editor of the, of the Times, can you give us some examples of challenges that you have faced as a person of color in the newsroom? And now what advice you would give to other people of color who are already involved in this industry um, or will be soon? Um, you know, I started as a reporter in New Orleans where I grew up um, <clears throat> and I was, you know, there were not a lot of black journalists in the, in the time when then the New Orleans States Items newsroom in 1979 or 78, maybe even 78, I guess. And most of the people who started around the same time as I did didn't are not in journalism anymore. Very, very few stayed in journalism, um, which is obviously a bad thing. But I, but I found myself, you know, I was covering a very different city. You know, I was, I grew up in an all black neighborhood, went to an all black grammar school, all black high school. And I suddenly found myself covering, you know, not only that world, but a half of a city I barely knew existed, literally. I mean, I would get lost when I went to uptown New Orleans and other parts of the city. Um, you know, I was a guy who grew up being told by my family that you had to be careful in dealing with police. My first job in journalism was as a police reporter, right? Um, and I think that I have always had challenges as, as a black man in a newsroom. I believe it was probably harder in the 1970s than it is today. There were very few of us. Um, my advice, I have a couple pieces of advice. First off, I actually think that newsrooms are much more understanding now about how bad they have been in not being diverse in the past. I think newsrooms get that now. Um, even though they don't, they, they may be slow to change, but I think they get that. Partly they get it because the country has changed dramatically. I mean, this is the country that I grew up in, which was, you know, the, the South that I grew up in was so different. I mean, this is a, the world is more diverse, in fact. And I think that there is no way that a newsroom can accurately cover the world if it doesn't start to resemble the world. So my advice is, first off, don't be shy about writing about race. My generation was more shy about writing about race. We didn't want to be stereotyped. <clears throat> I don't think that's a factor anymore. You shouldn't be shy about writing, it, writing about it. You shouldn't be shy about bringing what you have to bring to the party and being open about it, which probably wouldn't have been, would have been harder to do, frankly, 30 or 40 years ago when I started. Um, and you really should aspire to the top jobs in the newsroom. That's, that's my advice. And you should also, frankly, I'll, I'll go back to being naive again, or treacly. I just think that for all of the flaws of journalism, it's, it's a truly honorable, honorable profession and you can change the world. I believe in that. It's really inspiring. Um, and I totally agree with the fact that you need to match. Um, diversity in the newsroom mm -hmm. to um, the communities that we're um, reporting on. Um, and just for the final question, Dean, that I have for you, um, what is something that you want the journalists of tomorrow to take away um, from the experiences in your career? Um, boy, there's a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> first off, I do, I, I always say this, I'll say it again. You should actually, <clears throat> It, it, the, the profession is fun. We seem to be in a moment when people, even journalists, like to criticize the profession. You know, it's, I mean, it is healthy that people are questioning the profession. It's healthy that people are challenging the profession. It's healthy that people are criticizing the profession. But there's almost like a, a, um, a, um, sort of toxic attitude, even within the profession of journalism that bothers me a little bit. It's a really honorable profession and it's a lot of fun. And, and I think that's what I would want people to take away that, you know, it's, it is a profession that's worth participating in. 
um, it's a profession that at its best really can change the world. I think that's, that's what I would encourage people to take away. Um, and with that, that wraps up um, the, question, the questions that I had for you. Um, so it's time to move on to the audience Q and A. Um, so Vanessa, I believe they're taking that over. So thank you, Mackenzie. Great job. Thank you, know, you Mackenzie. You, know, Thanks, you, <laughs> you mentioned um, how noble of a profession journalism is, and I have to tell you, I am constantly, and I know. All of us at Cronkite are constantly inspired by our students, their passion, how motivated they are um, to pursue the career of journalism or something within mass communications. Um, but the reality also is that they are starting this journey at a time, and, and you and I also briefly touched upon this yesterday, where you know the level of mistrust in, in news and media, probably at an all-time high, uh, they go out to rip report stories and cover stories and they're accused of being fake news, et cetera. I'm wondering, and again, you, you've, you've talked about what a great profession you think this is, but I'm wondering if you have any specific advice for our students who are listening in right now um, as they try to push through all of these challenges yet still mm -hmm. committed to journalism, but again, facing some pretty, pretty tough circumstances at the moment. Yeah. Well, first off, we just came off of four years of a president who pretty constantly attacked the press, cynically attacked the press, um, who convinced a tremendous number of people in America that we were not only fake news, but that we were trying to hurt the country. So is it a surprise that there's so much mistrust in the profession? Um, I don't think so. We, are, we already had a trust issue even before that. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. I actually, I would love to understand better what trust in media really means. I, I think people trust their local newspapers and their local television stations. I think of trust in media as being like trust in Congress. Nobody likes Congress. Everybody likes their congressman. Nobody likes government. Everybody likes their local alderman. So I would say don't, don't be deterred by, by the, the monolithic notion that there's not a lot of trust in media. I would say that you should, um, you're gonna have to have a thick skin to be in journalism, um, frankly. That's always been the case, you know, um, but it's even more the case now. You're gonna have to have a thick skin. You're gonna have to sort of, you're gonna have to listen to criticism and, and understand that some of it's true. Um, that's one piece of advice. Don't shrug off all criticism. But mainly I would say you should be transparent about how you, how you do your work. Um, you should make sure that everybody understands in the newsroom and outside the newsroom the best you can. You should be transparent about how you do your work, who you are. And I honestly believe that when newsrooms look more like the country and when, when, when time passes from the Trump era, and if we are more out in the world telling our stories, we've never been good at defending ourselves and telling our stories. We always treat, we always acted as if, well, if you don't like us, you're just wrong. And that's not healthy. I think those things together over time, I gotta believe, um, will build some trust back in, in media. But mainly, you, do, you will have to have a thick skin and you will have to understand that some of the criticism is accurate, frankly. Uh, skeptical and, and full of themselves journalists? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so we actually already have uh, several questions from our students, so I'm sure to get to them. I know they're also eager to ask the question. So this one is coming from Chase and really interesting question here, Dean. So it says, how do you reconcile the aspirational ideal of fairness and the goal of defending democracy and limiting harm toward the subject of stories, especially considering that there are current policies and Chase brings up the recent Georgia voting restrictions that actually were just signed into law yesterday uh, that chip away at constitutional protections for citizens. And is it a challenge to adequately, adequately call out these anti-democratic actions? I can go back to that first part. Yeah. How do you reconcile the aspirational ideal of fairness with the goal of defending democracy and limiting harm toward the subject of stories? 
Well, fairness does not mean you can't call out bad actions. I mean, we called January 6th, the events of January 6th, what they were. We were pretty clear in describing what they were. And I think if you look at our coverage, most of our coverage of the <clears throat> what happened in Georgia and the restrictions on voting, we've made it pretty clear that these measures were designed to keep fewer people, fewer Americans from voting. And we've written stories about particularly how some of them were designed to keep fewer, fewer frankly, in Georgia, fewer Black Americans from voting. I, I don't think being fair means you can't call things out. I mean, you're, you're, you're being fair, you're being unfair to the reader if you don't tell the truth and call things out. I, I don't think there's a conflict there, to be perfectly frank. Um, I do think that sometimes people want us to call things out when we don't think that, that it's appropriate to call them out. Um, but I think that when the, if the reporting shows something, we should call it out, we should say it. We don't always do that. You know, sometimes people forget that a, a daily newspaper report has 250 stories constant and we get stuff wrong. But I don't think there's a conflict between being fair. It's fair to read or to call it out. So thank you for that. I know that means a lot to our students who, um, I know I've had students say, I'm, you know, I'm a journalist, but I also consider myself an activist. Some would say and argue that journalism is a form of activism uh, onto itself. Can I, can I talk about that or am I getting Absolutely. <clears throat> I think the role of journalists is to give people the information to let them decide whether or not to be activists. I think that journalism, there are parts of journalism that can be activists, absolutely. Um, but I think the difference between being an activist and being a journalist, being a traditional journalist, I mean, you know, I think publications that are activists can be journal journalism institutions. But the, I think, there are many differences, but among them is, I do think that it is, somebody once said to me, that if you really care about an idea or a position, you will let it be tested and you will like run it through the mill, the intellectual and the reporting mill. I think, I'll give you a specific example. I think that there are activists, for instance, who believe in defunding the police, I think if you go out and talk to a lot of people who are policed, you will get very different views about what changes there should be in policing. I think it's fine for an activist to take a strong position on that. I think a journalist should go out in the world and you will find that not everybody wants to defund the police. Some people see it as a different thing. Some people want to debate it and discuss it and chew over it. And that to me is the difference between activism and journalism. Thank you for that, Dean. So Salma wants to know, she is a sophomore at the Cronkite School. What are some steps that student journalists can take to make their way to a national news outlet like the <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to start at a national news outlet is my own view. Um, if I had started at the New York Times when, I mean, I was 30, 31 when I got to the New York Times. If I had started at the New York Times at 20, I, mean, I dropped out of college to become a, a reporter. So I started in journalism full-time at like 19 or 20. Do not do that, by the way. I do not recommend doing that. Um, please do not do that. Um, but I, I think it's best to just learn in smaller places where you can get much more attention, where you don't have to wait in line to do big stories. I mean, I was, I was writing front page stories at 20. Um, not because I was brilliant, I wasn't, I was far from it. It was because, you know, I, was, I worked for a small afternoon newspaper. Everybody got to write front page stories. If I had started at that age at the New York Times, in fact, the people I know who interned at the New York Times at that age, they didn't get to do the stuff I got to do. I got to make my mistakes, you know, in private, or at least in a smaller world, and you will make mistakes. Um, you will make mistakes throughout your career. So my view is you should be willing to live in different kinds of places. You should take advantage of the fact that journalism affords you the opportunity to see different parts of the country. I've, I have lived and worked in the South, the West, the Midwest, and the Northeast. 
Um, you should you should avail yourself of the country. You should work in smaller places if you can. You should you should. I mean, my own fantasy is that everybody starts in local news, where you get to wake up every morning with the people you cover and hear from them if they don't like it. Yeah, absolutely. So Casey wants to know, yesterday you said, and I quote, for the students in the audience, I promise you, if you choose this life, you will have much more fun than anyone ever should, end quote. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on this thought? What have been some of the most fun moments throughout your career in journalism? So everybody I went to high school and college with, and they do a variety of things. I don't think, I don't think anybody I went to high school or college with is a journalist. Some of them have made more money than I have in their lives. I have gotten to see the world. Remember, when I went, went away to college, I'd never been on an airplane. I've gotten to see the world. Um, I wake up on Monday morning, even at this stage in my career, not knowing what the week is gonna look like. I get to engage in the biggest, hardest subjects and a whole wide ranging. You know, I got to have a debate before this wasn't much of a debate, but a debate before this call is Larry McMurtry's death, a front page story. You know, so I got to read the obit of Larry McMurtry and have an exchange with our books editor about why she thought it was a front page obit. That's really interesting. That's fun. That's exciting. You know, as a reporter, you know, I've gotten to travel the world, sit down with interesting people. I got to have lunch with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, in which I didn't say a word because I was too intimidated. And I went from there to a, to a meeting with the president of Mexico at the time, and I got to beat him up because that's what we do with politicians and what we're afraid to do with writers. Boy, that's interesting. That's more interesting than any of my friends, sure. Not bad examples. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty jealous right now. <laughs> So Daniel, one of our students wants to know, do you believe the future of journalism will be independent writers who have their own channels, for example, YouTube or podcasts, other types of medium, instead of being in a newsroom where there is an old system of hierarchy? I think it's gonna be all of the above, frankly. Um, I mean, I think one of the great developments in journalism, I mean, social media, even though it's a, it can be a pain, it's terrific. Um, you know, it's given voice to people who wouldn't have had voice before. Um, it's elevated, you know, different kinds of writers, different ways of thinking. Um, I think it's going to be, I think, I always, think, I do believe there will be big traditional news organizations because those are the only ones with the size and the resources to do things like, you know, when we did this, when we investigated Donald Trump's taxes last year, that was three reporters for almost a year and 10 or 12 graphics artists, editors for six or seven months. I think you're always gonna need big, powerful news organizations that can, you know, we have, a, we have maintained Baghdad and Kabul bureaus, even as the wars have waned. You know, we have a house in Kabul that we pay rent on and a full staff. Um, you know, we, we maintain bureaus in parts of the world you know, in the farthest reaches of the world and, and the country. And, you know, we, we do it no matter, you know, no matter what. We have to provide security for people. There's a ton of expense and ambition that I think big news, or you will always need institutions like the New York Times to, to just do and protect. But I love the fact that somebody who is really thoughtful about a particular issue who lives in New Orleans can write about it and can build an audience if she has something to say and can even hopefully make a living if she has something to say. So I think it's going to be all of the above. Yeah. Well, I'm going to circle back really quickly to something that you said in passing, but caught my attention. You said social media can be a pain. Uh, why, do you, why do you feel that way? Why did you say that? Well, it's mostly good. <laughs> um, it just really is. Look, you know, take away the journalism questions. You know, the fact that a, you know, if you can picture a kid, a lonely kid in New Orleans who needs to reach people who are like him or her 
in other parts of the country. That, that is, that's remarkable. The fact that people can ask hard questions about monolithic institutions like the New York Times, that's really, that's really important, that's great. But it also you know, allows people to, um, to seek out only people who agree with them. It also sort of allows people to sort of, you know, cement their own views by not seeking out people who have different views. And if you manage a newsroom of 1,700 people, it's also hard to manage um, people who, you know, who want to express strong opinions, um, which while I believe journalists should have strong opinions, I don't think there should be a cacophony of hundreds of journalists Express, expressing different opinions about different subjects, frankly. I think if you, if the New York Times wants to bill itself as an institution that seeks the truth and tries to be fair, it is just harder to do that if 300 people who work in the newsroom are expressing views about things um, and then have to cover it and convince people that they're open-minded. So that's what I meant. Thank you for expanding on that. that this is a conversation that we are continuously having with our yeah. students. Um, Patricia wants to know, as a leader in the newsroom, how did you go about reflecting on the, quote, fake news stories that were targeted towards not only the New York Times, but also other news outlets? Um, I'm, I'm missing a beat. You mean stories that were targeted? I don't think... How did you manage, and you, mm -hmm. and you have mentioned it yourself, the... Mm -hmm challenging and at times contentious relationship, for example, with the previous presidential administration oh, I see. I see. Um, being constantly I see. attacked, called fake news. How did you manage that? You know, we tried to be tr more transparent. Look, news, newsrooms are not, you know, as, trans as transparent as they should be. We tried to be more transparent. We tried to explain to people how we do our work. We try to tell people how many sources we have for our work. Um, and we put together some of the most fantastic investigative muscle there was because we thought that that, I thought that that was the way to cover this remarkable and different president. We wrote more about Donald Trump and his history of dealing with women than anybody else. We wrote the first stories. We were the first ones to find his taxes, to write about his taxes. We were the first ones to write about his finances. Every word that we wrote on those subjects has proven to be true. Not a single word has been challenged meaningfully. Even he hasn't been able to put a dent in any of the things we've written about his finances. So my view of when you're challenged and we were very transparent, we showed our work. And just that is just one example. I think when you're challenged, you show your work, you are undeterred, you continue to be aggressive in your reporting. We were aggressive and steadfast, and we were driven by reporting, not hot takes. I love this question. It comes from Daniel. It seems like you're a busy person. <laughs> On average, how many hours per week do you work? Um, I work seven days a week. Um, I do something seven days a week. Um, I probably work, it varies well. I mean, 14 hours a day, sometimes 15, more if I have to. Um, you know, you, you, you will work a lot in journalism. You work harder than a lot of other people. And the nature of my job, you know, there's news every day. I'm in touch with the newsroom every day. Um, a lot, a lot. But remember what I said. I mean, is talking to the books editor about Larry McMurtry for half an hour? That ain't hard work. You know, <laughs> sorry. You know, that's, that's fun work. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff in those long hours. What do you do for fun when you're not working? Um, I, I am an avid um, gallery goer to whatever the word. My wife and I go to galleries all the time. I love art. I love visual art. Um, that's the main thing that I do when I have time. Pretty much in the pre-COVID um, 
a you know visiting four or five galleries on a Saturday and even dropping into a museum on a Sunday was pretty typical. And I grew up in the back of a restaurant in New Orleans, so I also love to cook. Nice. So this question comes from Allison. Have you ever had an interview where you were, quote, insanely nervous? If so, who was it with? Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It was, it was, it wasn't an interview. And I'll tell you about one interview where I was a little nervous. It was, you know, he had that we were in Mexico City where he had a house and he, he agreed to have lunch with about five or six of us. And it was just intimidating. Journalists don't get intimidated. Um, but this was really intimidating. I mean, I, I, you know, if he'd asked me to cut his food for him, I would have done it. You know, that's not the way journalists think. I did an interview um, that was so far over my head about three years ago. The only, we, we, we decided that T Magazine, which is one of our magazines, really wanted an interview with Jay-Z, which is really hard to get. So they used me as bait. And I said, yes, because I figured he would say no. And he said, yes. <laughs> I watched that interview. <laughs> <laughs> so I am of the generation that listened to Jay-Z, but I didn't know that much about his life. So I spent a long time reading and thinking about it. And um, that was a little intimidating, not, not because he's Jay-Z, but because I, I was interviewing somebody you know, on a subject that I didn't know enough about. So I had to learn a lot. But it was interesting and he was open, surprisingly open. And it's good to, to know that Dean Baquet can still get nervous uh, in an interview <laughs> just three years ago. That is very reassuring to a lot of people. <laughs> no, I, get, I can get nervous, sure. <laughs> so Alifa wants to know, what has been one thing this past year actually that you have learned or that you feel you have been taught as a journalist? Um, I have, I, I think that the one of the, look, I grew up in an era when journalists worked all the time and often sacrificed their personal lives. I mean, I think everybody who has spent a lot of time in, the, in a newsroom where the story, the work never stops. I learned, I learned to be more empathetic to my staff. I always thought of myself as, a, as somebody who cared about how people live their lives. And I, I always cared, thought of myself as somebody who was empathetic, but I was also somebody who if a story broke, you put 10 people on an airplane to chase the story. And the story comes first. You know, When I was a reporter, an executive editor asked me to go to Oklahoma City to run the bombing coverage I just, you just hop on an airplane, you go. I learned this year the fact that everybody was experiencing, you know, some difficulty because of COVID, that I learned more about understanding that people had lives to live. And I think I became more empathetic as a leader and as a boss. I think I was okay hearing that people couldn't hop on airplanes whenever I wanted them to. Yeah, I think that's been a critical piece, right, of, of yeah. this challenging time. Yeah. So Patricia would like to know, and it's interesting, you, you briefly touched upon this. Um, did you ever have any mental health obstacles that you've had to overcome throughout your career? What advice would you give to those who are trying to make it into journalism and who do struggle with their mental health at times? Um, boy, that is a good question. You know, I'm honest enough to say that I've had therapy in my life, um, which I frankly think everybody should have therapy in their lives. I think part of, part of one piece of advice that I would give is don't be shy about saying that or about talking about, you know, whatever your mental health issues are. You should, if you work in a big institution like the New York Times, you should demand that you get the resources you need to take care of yourself. Um, but, you know, everybody brings something to the table that makes them more empathetic as journalists. And I use the word empathetic a lot. I prefer empathetic to objective. I prefer empathetic to everything else. And, you know, if one of the things you bring to the table is that you've had challenges in your life, including mental health challenges, you know, that can also make you a better journalist. 
It can make you listen better and it can make you understand other people's problems. So I would say you should not let it be an obstacle to work or to life. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Dean. I know that this is a topic that is incredibly important to many of our students. Mm -hmm. So was there a moment when you realized that you wanted to be a journalist? Uh, what was that? Did you have a, a life situation occur to you? Uh, was it an aha moment? Um, how did you realize and how did you know that this was what you wanted to do with your life and your career? It was the moment I walked in the newsroom. I did not grow up wanting to be a journalist. I was the editor of my high school paper, but that was just because it looked like fun. I went to college, I was an English major. And the only reason I applied for a job at the afternoon paper in New Orleans, frankly, was because I missed my girlfriend and I was homesick. And it was really easy to get internships in those days because every city had two or three newspapers. It's not like today, right? So I got a news, <laughs> I got an internship at the afternoon paper in New Orleans, which no longer exists, the state's item. And I just <clears throat> couldn't believe it. You know, the people were interesting and I could write for a living. And every day was unexpected. Um, so it was a moment I walked into a newsroom, <laughs> frankly, and not a moment before. I, I think that is a critical moment for many people, right? When you walk into a newsroom for the very first time and you feel that energy, right. um, it, it, it stays with you. I think that's one of the moments that everybody can remember when they first walked into a newsroom. And it was, in, I mean, you could hear that they were loud. <laughs> there were a lot of characters that, you know, this was the era of when there were still typewriters. Um, so newsrooms were loud. The printing presses were still in the basement. There was no internet, of course. And it was just like exciting. And you, you know, you woke up in the morning and you, you know, the city, city editor would call and say, can you go X place to cover X? And it was just interesting. And you were, you, if you were shy as I was, you had permission to ask people anything you wanted to ask them. Yeah. And it yeah. was just, you know, amazing. Yeah, it's magical. It yeah. really is. Yeah. So Fernando wants to know, and this, this is a, I like this question a lot. Have you ever used, or do you ever use your love for art and museums in journalism? Yeah, um, I do, maybe badly, but I do. Um, you know, I, I'm, I love participating in discussions with the designers at the paper. Um, we did this, you know, when, 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 there, when the 100,000th death was recorded, um, after the, uh, in the pandemic, and we did this sort of amazing all front page story with all, only the names. And Tom Bodkin, who's the, you know, the genius art director of the New York Times brought that to me. And I just, you know, I, it was aesthetically just so powerful. I love talking to him. You know, I, I get to, you know, the only time I ever um, pull my weight is I get critics to take me around. Um, I went to, you know, an art show last, last Saturday with one of our writers. Um, no, I love, I love doing that. And I love, I don't think of my, I don't, I do not get in the way of photo editors who know what they're doing, but, I, but I like talking to them and I like, and I appreciate the aesthetics and the news choices. Um, no, I do. So I do. Yeah. Interesting. So the next two questions are, are linked actually. Tyson wants to know, what would you recommend to an aspiring journalist in order to get started? Um, you really need to be, you, and this, this is, sounds easy, but it's hard. You really need to be in touch with the world. You need to read a lot, whether it's books or whatever. You just need to be in touch with the world. It's amazing to me how many, how many people want to be journalists and don't know what's going on in the world. You just got to be in touch with the world, right? You got to like, you know, you just got to read. You have to be a voracious reader and student of the world. And then I think you have to, you know, you have, you, no matter what, you, what, what your discipline is, I think reading period is really healthy and helpful. Um, and being, I think, I think, I think there's no part of journalism that does not benefit from being a good writer. Thank you for saying that because I feel like an old school professor when I tell my students, you have to read. 
<laughs> you know, you, you yourself have to be informed in order to inform, right? That's right. So I appreciate that. And so Patricia, again, sort of linked here in a way, if you were to conduct an interview for a new journalist or editor, what are some key aspects that you would look for in that interviewee? I would love, I, I do not like, and I said this yesterday, one of, this is a pet peeve, I don't love certainty. I, really, I always cringe when people, unless you're a real expert, like if you're a physicist and you have, you're certain about X, and I'm not talking about moral certainty, that's, that's different. I, I, I like people who are really curious and I like people who have more questions than answers. You know, good. The best journalists I know ask more than they answer. Um, those, those are the, the and 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 I like people who, um, I guess, curiosity is like the greatest. I mean, I love when I'm interviewing somebody for a job. If they display curiosity, they ask questions about me or the New York Times or things they saw in the world. Or I really, I like that a lot. So. How would you say, let's, let's put it on the table here, that the Times is approaching its coverage of President Biden versus President Trump? Just yesterday, President Biden had his first press conference. Mm -hmm. So how, how is the Times approaching this new administration in comparison to the yeah. previous one? Well, they're very different, right? I mean, all politicians obfuscate or exaggerate. Donald Trump was in a completely different stratosphere. And we use the word lie. Um, people say we didn't use it enough. I'm not sure I agree, but we used it before anybody else did. We used it during the campaign. Um, I don't think you'll need the constant fact checking for Joe Biden. Doesn't mean you shouldn't challenge him, but it's a, it's a different exercise. <clears throat> but I think the, the, the overall notion that you're supposed to hold power to account is, stands for any president. But I don't think it's our job to prove that we're tough. I think that's like not journalistic. We should just be tough. Um, um, but I think, I think, look, I think they're very, they're very different. You, you can shift Donald Trump, frankly, because he didn't have firm policies that he pushed, um, was more, you covered him more as a politician, frankly. Joe Biden is pushing policies, you know, you know, from, from dramatic childcare policies to, you know, how to deal with the virus in a different way. And I think that we should be covering him with experts and asking hard questions about his policies. You spoke a little bit yesterday about the fact that COVID-19 is the biggest story that you have covered. Um, and you've covered many stories in your career. Mm -hmm. uh, can you expand a little bit on that? And, and I'll share with you, Dean, that our students now have been going to school remotely for over a year, just like many newsrooms across the country. Um, they are now going to school from home, from other locations, uh, locations other than campus. It, it's been a tough time for many of them. I'm yeah. wondering if you have any words of encouragement or advice that you can give them to get through these, these challenging times and push through and continue to do the good journalism that I know our students are committed to doing. Yeah. Um, the reason I think it's such a large, you, you answered the question, actually. The reason I think it's the biggest story is that it affects everyone. I mean, there's no one who is not affected by this. Um, other stories have had dramatic impact, but it's been more isolated. Everybody's affected by, by this in how they work and how they interact with their loved ones and who they can see, who they can travel. They've lost jobs. You know, from the from the hardest stuff to people who've lost family members to the most mundane stuff, the inability to travel and visit your, you know, your kid or your, you know, your mother, or your father. Um, you know, I I think my my advice is less journalist. My journalistic advice is related to but different to my human advice. My journalistic advice is. You know, when you live through historic times, you should record it and think about it and understand that you're living through historic times. I mean, you, you will talk about this. People will write books about this. There will be movies about this. There will be. So really, really understand the, the moment you're in. Um, you know, keep a journal. 
um, just like record what you're saying. It's pretty, it's, it's, I mean, it's remarkable. As a human being, I would say, um, <clears throat> be generous to yourself. Um, you, you will, I mean, people are going to lose a year. And I think you should be, you know, put aside the financial repercussions and stuff, but, <clears throat> you know, just be kind to yourself. Um, you know, you have to, everybody's lost a year in their profession and in their lives. And just like be, you know, be kind to yourself and be kind to your friends and your colleagues and the people you work with and your editors and your, <clears throat> just be kind to yourselves. This is hard. It won't last forever, but it's hard. Yeah. Can you maybe share with us, Dean, if, if you're so inclined, some of the challenges that you have faced within the past year, maybe more on a, on a personal level? I know you touched upon that briefly yesterday and how you've been able to manage that. You know, I look, I'm fortunate. My life has not been as transformed as others. So I wouldn't compare, you know, the <clears throat> advantage of being in my position is you know, I'm near the end of my career, my journalistic career. So in terms of my personal life, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. My wife and son are healthy. Um, I have family members who've been affected by it in New Orleans and elsewhere. But, but for the most part, my life has been, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge for a leader. You know, you have to work. I mean, there are, there are people who work for the New York Times who've never been in our newsroom, who've never met their colleagues. I talked to people who got hired two days before we walked out of the newsroom. That's really, you know, the reason we talked earlier about one reason people want to work for in newsrooms is for this excitement. <clears throat> you know, I, I try to reach out to those people. I try to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I do more one-on-ones with different kinds of people like that. And I just try to talk to them, reassure them, ask them what they're working on. Um, it's a big place. It's a little hard to do, but I've, I've sort of made myself try to mentor more younger journalists who, who, you know, are more, who have not spent a lot of time at the New York Times just to talk them through, you know, the year. And, and I just am I'm trying to sort of reach out to people more and have different kinds of conversations with people. We've touched upon a lot of different topics during this conversation, Dean. We have about a minute left. Mm -hmm. um, last words for our students that you would like to leave them with. They can be mm -hmm. anything you want. Look, you are living through, no, no, put COVID aside, um, if that's possible. You are living through a pretty dramatic rethinking of journalism. Everybody's focused on the debate over objectivity. Frankly, I think that's not the only debate. <clears throat> You're living through a period where Everything is going to look different in 10 years. Everything. Um, we've learned we can work from home. I believe in working from a newsroom, but we've learned we can work from home. The, the digital transformation of newsrooms is going to change how we write. We, it's already changed how we write. We write stories completely differently than we did in purely the print era. Everything's changing. So I would say go into it really open-minded. Accept some of the traditions of journalism, fairness, and some of the other things we talked about, curiosity, open-mindedness. I would argue that those are powerful traditions you should embrace. But you're going to get to reinvent this thing. And I think that's, I can't imagine anything more exciting than that. It's going to look different, and you get to shape it. I, I you know, that's amazing to me. I'm jealous. Well, Dean Bacay, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, especially for thank someone you. who works an average of 14 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> we do appreciate it. I know our thank students, um, I don't want to speak for them, but they are very lucky to hear your words and your perspectives. And on behalf of the Cronkite School, thank you also for being here with us today. Mackenzie, any last words? Um, no, besides just thank you so much um, for speaking with me today. I really, I learned a lot from you, so I really appreciate your time. Well, I've learned a lot from your questions, really. They were challenging, they were good. Thank you. Um, hopefully one day I'll see you all in 
person, I'll visit the campus. But thank you. It was an honor, and, and I really enjoyed doing this, and good luck to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean. Be good. Take care. Go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.